is the man himself. Well, I introduce myself. State your name and, and number. <clears throat> Aaron Thompson. Or I actually can go under the name Aaron Wayne Thompson. If I'm, if I'm trying to sound fancy. Mm. Aaron Thompson. Writer slash film director. Amongst film, other film things. Film director. Film, film director. Now, if you say filmmaker, people think you might just work on films. So now I just say film director. And it's why you say author as well. When you say writer, people just think you do like. What's that word? Auteur. 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 Or artist, but I can't put artist. Artist. On a, artist, but I can't put artist on a CV. This is the bookcase. The bookcase. What never gets any tidier. So, so there's a lot of stigma attached to what a filmmaker is and what a writer is. I think people think that if you're a filmmaker, you're in Hollywood or you go into film festival after film festival and you live this sort of life. I don't think it's ever really been the case for filmmakers unless you are in Hollywood. So yeah, I think actually being a filmmaker and being a writer is not just being a filmmaker and being a writer. I think it covers many other things, including travel, communication, you're working with teams of people. Events planning. Events planning. So, Um, I actually had I actually had no inspiration whatsoever for writing. I I'd never read a book until I was twenty. So I was actually writing before I actually read a book. Obviously I read a book at school, but I don't count that as like individual reading. Um but the you must best have started books and just not finished them, right? No. You didn't pick I, a book. I seriously never read a book. No. I mean I still can't spell great. I have dys- dyslexia, which is a word you can't spell if you've got dyslexia. Um, yeah, I, I, obviously I can't sound words outright in my head, um, but it sort of turned into a superpower because because I couldn't spell words out properly, I could put them in more order. So you have just done what? I could put them in order in a more interesting way. I wrote my first book by accident. So, <laughs> the first, like... The first publication I put together, I put this together myself and with my editor, right, <laughs> is ridiculous. I mean, look at the size of this thing. So basically, I write, I wrote, write, wrote under the the name Keeps because I used to be a really good goalkeeper, so people used to nickname me Keeps. So I used to be a bit of a ghostwriter, and this is four years. So I started writing this when I was sixteen. Didn't know I was writing it. Finished it when I was twenty. Um, it went under a different name. Now it's called Whiskey Soda. Um, and then the professionals came in and took over and then <laughs> they made it more palatable. So <laughs> like, you might actually want to like buy this now. But also interestingly as well, um, when I wrote this book, I just had to plead with every single editor to keep it word by word how it was written, which meant spelling, which meant like, words what nobody what I used but nobody knew what like it meant and I got absolutely hell for wanting to do that like nobody would take it nobody wanted it everybody thought it was a bad artistic idea but I just wanted to keep that like original writing then I go to France and I find this book behind me <laughs> where every Wait, hold on hold on what uh, I'll have you know that I was the one that spotted it first and I pointed it out. I found this book. What mm. every single word is misspelled as the style. <laughs> <laughs> so I should be born in France. So yeah, the second book, the sequel, the beautiful nothing. There it is. Which is one of my favorite designs for a book. I always want a book with no spine, no back, just a cover. I just like classy books, but it's not too much on it. Now this, for me, is the best thing I've ever written. And, and this was after. I had written Whiskey Soda, the first book. So what I'm trying to get at is once you've got something out of your system, this was a book where, okay, now I was trying to be a writer. So I, I never really got on with education, but I love education, but I couldn't really find my place in it. So I decided to take a gap year when I was 17 and suddenly it just sort of exploded my life into colour you know, music, film, writing, everything just came at me. I feel like I, I feel like I wanted to be a film critic, um, and I'll spend every single day I could 
in uh, Doncaster Waterstones. I sit at the top in the cafe and just read through all the books about film. You know, when people take them out but don't buy them, people get annoyed like I was that person. The only thing I had was Doncaster View, which I went to religiously. Like I go by myself, I go with friends, but there was a bunch of us, a group of us, none of them went on to study film or do anything with film, but we used to sit in the McDonald's opposite the dome and other cafes as well um, and just talk about film. Sometimes we would like reenact films, sometimes we would write our own films um, and then they sort of told me about Doncaster College and how they think there's a film, a, um, what do you call it? What do you call the thing you go to study? A course. A, a film course. <laughs> <laughs> but I, think, no, I was trying to think of better words for it now. So the first year of college, my work was terrible. And we're going to include a little clip. Which we're now. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, my work was terrible. My, my intentions were, were I, I didn't actually want to be a filmmaker. I had no technical experience. I couldn't even edit a clip together. Back on the Mac, you had to press I and O to cut. I couldn't even work to do that out. I was... I was not compute orientated at all, I did not like technology. I failed to turn a camera on on my first ever day. Um, all my work did not turn out very good or the way I, I wanted it. In year two, I made a, f well, I, I shot an image what I thought was quite striking and it was very surprising for me, I didn't really know. I, I All the information I had obtained from watching films and um, all the work, I slowly carved that image what I thought was good. And that's what got me thinking about actually being a filmmaker. When I left college, um, I had produced my first striking image, but I still wasn't really happy with my final major project. Um, I think I could. I thought I could do a lot better. It didn't turn out how I wanted it to turn out. Um, I decided not to go against university. I just decided I would see what I could do on my own. So. Um, I started work on a film using my friends. I signed my friend on a napkin. And that's when I started working on Two Birds. The two people came to watch it. It was not a success. The, I liked the film, but you know, sadly, he didn't really do anything. But I decided that I wasn't going to let that stop me. And I took pictures of the screen and I, and I hung on to the idea the night of. And then I sent an email to an actor in the area. And... Um, she said yes. Yes, Haley was the first name drop. Haley was the first because my film didn't do very well at this little festival put on. Um, actually, a guy stood up and critiqued it. He's like, he, he's, he's not. He didn't like it. Let's just say that. Yeah. Um, but I thought it was really good for my level and what I had done. So I was really happy with it. This guy didn't like it. Um, so I thought my next job I was going to have to look for people maybe of my age so Haley was close to my age and people wanted to try and do something with what wasn't happening in the area so I took screenshots of the the festival and I put a little dossier together and I started trying to look for actors in the area and that's when I found Haley and Haley agreed to do Cuttlefish which was a disaster <laughs> so Cuttlefish was about identity um, about being trapped in a situation and wanting to disappear. And I had, I think I had rewrote it probably 50 times. I'd shot probably more than I've ever shot for like an actual feature film. I'm not joking that. I just shot things after. I just went out of my camera just shooting so much footage. Um, I just couldn't get it right in the edit. I couldn't get across what I was trying to get across. And it took nine months. Like I actually started a job as a web designer during that time because I just couldn't get it right so that was probably one of those points in my life where I was like N I maybe can't work this out right. so after I finished Cuttlefish eventually I thought I'm going to slow the tempo down so I started working on chapter 11 I had sent Cuttlefish out to a few actors and it actually, I actually played it in um, a few places outside the area, and it did okay. Um, it was received as a sort of like um, one of those art films. So I was like, okay, that's, that's cool. Um, and this is where I met Greg, Greg Chipman, who's a magician, also actor. Um, so um, 
now I had the resource of two actors who I think liked me and like we were just enjoying working together. I brought Greg and Haley together. So this is how resources slowly gather. And I also started to know what I was doing. I know where I wanted the court. I actually started filming a lot tighter. So it took nine months to make like a, a seven minute thing. I shot Adam plus Eve, which is a film about a relationship where each member of the relationship starts growing distant of each other to the events that you try and recapture the moment of the start, but it's not the same. When I started working on that, um, I just knew exactly what I wanted and exactly what I wanted to do. And that was, I'd probably say, my first success. Because when I showed it to people, people were like, oh, you're now a filmmaker. Yeah. This had a papers and list. So I was, um, I was working a job as a web designer and um, doing these short films on the side and I still wasn't really sure where this was going. And at the time, we wasn't trying to do anything. We were just having fun. We were just firing the films out. So I started working on another film with another actor. Um, there was just, like It was just a manic period of creation. Like The sun was out. We were introducing each other into our lives. Was hanging out with people. Was cre- we were creating a little scene. So I started working on a film called Mickey, which I actually never played anywhere, but I did show it to my friends because it was a character invented by my friends. It was this sort of dropout guy who never really grew up and couldn't really get out this this lifestyle and just sort of drove around. It was just sort of like a hangout film. Um, it didn't really have an ending. I just remember it just ending, but. Um, yeah, incredibly fun to work on. So Sugar, which is a film about a serial killer addicted to sugar, was now me comfortable with my skills. So I've still got this job in the office and I've created all these short films now and I'm just having fun. And this is the one where we started really trying to push what we could do with filmmaking. So we went for all traditional props to show violence um, and we started I, I think it was the point of the film I became mature success amongst my friends audiences mm. so um, after I finished Sugar um, the summer had sort of ended or well, was ending and I got really serious now so Coffee Club is about not wanting to be alive anymore and what that means and um, it's basically for the coffee lovers how important just having a coffee is like when you have a coffee you communicate to people when you have a when you have a coffee it sort of perks you up and you feel like you can get on with the day so it's about this person doesn't want to live anymore and go searching for the best coffee ever and I would say this is now me writing films I would want to see and what um, everything I had done since this film, everybody always goes back to this film as like the best thing I've done and I sort of agree it was all that work, all that time at college all that work after what led to my ability to write this and it was, it came out exactly how I wanted and it was exactly uh the style I've always wanted. If if there's ever been a film what I've done, what is exactly how I feel and want to get across, that that's the film. So Coffee Club was a huge success and it put me into a complete different realm. Like more people wanted to try and work with me. Um yeah that that was a crazy time. So when I did um Coffee Club um I tried to get my next fi- uh, short film, because I was just going to keep making short films the rest of the year. Um, I tried to, I got, and I was trying to do something to get into a film festival in France. So, massively into the filmmaker Godard. So, I wanted to try and do a bit of a tribute to him. So, I made a film in French, with French music, French subtitles. And the problem was, be- it wasn't very good. And it's probably one of the worst things I've ever made. Because I sucked the success of Coffee Club, I basically, my ego was all over the place and um, nobody was really reining my creative talent. 
and I just went a bit crazy and made something what um I mean it's got some cool shots in it but it doesn't work and it makes no sense and I didn't even get to play it in France so <laughs> but you learnt your lesson from that experience mm. didn't you but I learnt my lesson and every time I learn my lesson I just slow the pace down so I started working on another film we're out of summer now, I think this is in October of the same year I'm still a web designer and I just really slowed it down and I worked on a film called Last Days and this um this is about a scientist. I was really into David Bowie at the time, like his movements and how he looked on stage. So I wanted to try and create a scientist who was a bit dorky, a bit stiff movement, a bit stiff movement, a bit stiff and moving, um, who comes back to Earth to try and solve the problems, um, but I'm not letting the audience in on what the problems are. And well, I don't want to ruin the ending. So it was nice to actually go back and sort of prove filmmakers can be smart as well. Last Days, never as big as Coffee Club, but it had a lot of like, a lot of film people that came to like, you know film, the, the, the film bunch would go to festivals and just live off like, Mumbai in the art house scene, like they really liked Last Days. But the film I did next, Dixie Cups, which is a film about a guy who takes these drugs what makes him hallucinate an ape coming out of the woods which was a representation to how I felt at the time because it's all there's just so much like stuff happening in my life I didn't really know which way it could go I felt like I had this sort of like ape character following me around trying to take me down bad avenues um, and it was an art house film like it, like it's structured, it's not house film, but everybody loved it. I mean, everybody. This is the most interesting thing. Like, um, you know, I had people what didn't really know anything about film. I didn't really uh, haven't even really watched like they've watched one film in a year, and they really, really enjoyed the work. And it's not as good as Coffee Club, but everybody to this day always. I've still got like the ape suit in the loft. He's always talking to you about. <laughs> here it is. It's not in the loft. <laughs> it's here. Here it is. So yeah, this is like. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, it's the most fun I've ever had making a film. It was the hardest film production I've ever done because it was freezing, and I remember our hands were just frozen. It was snowing. Um, but yeah, for some reason it just struck a chord. Like you really can't guess what's going to stri strike a chord. And this was the one Dixie Cups. Do you know what Dixie Cup is? No. You know the gym? There's those little cone cups. Yeah. That's a Dixie Cup. Oh, right. We hold water in. I dropped it right. on the floor. So that's how I came up with the title. Because I was like, this is so impractical. So I just thought it'd be a good name for a film. Yeah, so at this point I sort of realised... Um, I, I don't know if so many people are watching short films anymore. Um, the short films, what were being made, I didn't really want anything to do with. There were... Um, I didn't think you could be as creatively free. Um, I had a lot of issues with my short films in the first place because, by definition, a short film is supposed to be like seven minutes long and some of my short films are like 15 minutes long. Um, so I couldn't really get into to enter some of the bigger festivals. So... I was getting to a point where I, this was so Dixie Cups was my tenth short film. I think that's right. I had I had as about as much success as I thought I could have. I mean, I think people make short films to get a, something on their CV, and um, they are good short festivals. But I didn't really have the resource, the time to go to travel into festivals, and it was something I wasn't really trying to do this is the thing I think I think when I look back and talk about this thing I was just enjoying making short films just just for my friends and just you know just for myself really like I wasn't really trying I was just so I'd started working on the interlude which is based loosely off a true story what I overheard um can't confirm it's true but I think it is um <laughs> and it's about 
um, a father who gets out of jail and hasn't seen his son in 25 years and goes to see his son and tries to keep his son from um, following him in his footsteps and going to crime but sadly the father only ends up making it worse because he can't really escape his life of crime um, which is based off a, a story what happened very close to me um, so yeah I guess I was trying to get more serious and I guess I was kind of making like a little episode I think it's more like a little TV you know episode and actually when I was uh, writing it and I'd, I spent it all so I spent this is the longest I've ever spent filming something apart from Cuttlefish but I spent about a month filming this and I was taking my time and I shot it bit by bit every single day I was working with uh, and uh, Andrew Ayahuasca and I always butcher his last name so sorry on that again he was like a real actor so it was you know intimidating um, but yeah so the interlude which is why I called the interlude was also supposed to be the gap in my career as well it's like this is the last short film I'm going to make I can't do any more short films um, I don't know what's going to be next but off the back of the success of that sh uh, short film and it wasn't the best thing I ever did it was never as good as Coffee Club but it was good enough um, I was able to get a lot of interest and a lot of backing to support me in the scary thing what was coming next which was actually making a feature film I, have, I actually haven't really thought what I was going to say about so I listened to this song called Picture Perfect or Pitch Perfect no it's Picture Perfect by Little Sims and the opening line is Welcome to Wonderland I thought, okay, I got a title. That's a good place to start. I liked how it was sort of sarcastic. It's like a sarcastic title, like, welcome to this world. So I had the title. <laughs> so, yeah, so based off my um, short films and my last short film being half an hour, if you put all the short films together, that was three hours long. So that's basically a long film. So tackling a film, it wasn't a million miles away from me. Straight. I made many mistakes, like, um, I tried to, I thought it'd be really clever if I just filmed something in London to make it look like it has high production value, but um, it was just a waste of money and resources, because you can just film stuff anywhere and make it look like anything. So yeah, I thought if I could approach the film, like in anthology, and just shoot bit by bit, so I'd shoot a bit a week, save it on a hard drive, shoot another bit next week. I thought if I could just do it like that bit by bit, I could eventually do the film. Um, I, you know, I sort of write as it went along. The film is about six characters. Youth. See if I can remember. <laughs> youth. This is going to be out of order. I can never remember. Yeah, Youth Faith. Genius, love, fame, and death. So these are six characters what I thought represented life. And each of these characters were facing their own predicaments as the world was about to end. I think it's David Lynch pretty... A razor head is pretty much felt within the, the DNA of it. So I think it took me probably six months to edit I think a month was me procrastinating like I just couldn't get my head around the fact I was about to edit a film um, I got my long term uh, friend and collaborator Peter to come and help me he he actually pulled a lot of the stuff off I was trying to because I had meticulized this whole film thought about this whole film for nearly two years I had no idea how I was actually going to how it was going to look and how I was going to put it all together because it was just loads of clips what I had shot over time Um the film's finished. The production team were working on getting the film out. We were going to do a leg in Edinburgh. We are going to do a leg in London. There was other plans for it as well. It was an exciting time. Um, I was able to get two more deals off the back of it. Um, one was another film deal. and One was a writing deal. So I've made the film. But I'm not really... It hasn't been shown anywhere yet. So it's like... It's almost like I'm at the finishing line. And COVID comes and then it's gone. And it's like, okay, I don't really know what what I am anymore or, or what's happened I had every single 
piece of bad luck happen to me, what could happen? Losing a producer, um, just everything you could ever imagine. <laughs> too much going into detail, too, too heartbreaking. Because I had worked on one film now, one feature film, and had finished it and I knew the tempo of it, and I had the resources and I had I still had the respect and the actors around me and people willing to help me and this deal had gone wrong but people that offered support, other filmmakers were coming out and saying, How about you tried this? And somebody sent me a film, um well somebody said that I should check out this film by a filmmaker which I already liked, uh, called Andrew Cotton, um, called the Whalebone Box and he had made this film, some of it was shot on the phone, um, which was gonna be useful because it was hard to get resources for COVID and um, he shot on limited budget so I thought I could do this so I started working on the Tin Man um, so the Tin Man now this is going to be a hard one to explain <laughs> people always ask me what it's about and I'm like uh... um, <laughs> <laughs> so the Tin Man <laughs> no, I, 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 the Tin Man's like three things right it's a film within a film within a film. <laughs> so this basically this is Christopher Nolan on a budget. But the film's also about me as a filmmaker pretending to be a filmmaker <laughs> <laughs> who's going to interview these That's messiahs. Funny, actually, but way, these yeah. messiahs are just normal people, but they're also pretending to be the messiahs in a film. So the whole thing is about perception and how as soon as the camera's on us, we start pretending. Ah, Greg, and he's going to take the gimbal off me. I'm going to be lying out on the floor here, right. and I've got the, the, the coffee in the thing. I'm pretty much nearly dead. Yeah. I'm like shaking as well. You don't really have to say anything to me. I think I might have a cigarette. I'm that cold. And then you take the thing, and you start walking back, okay? Just holding it. Just holding it. Yeah. But as you're walking back, this bit's going to have to be slow, because Greg's got to get back into position. Right, okay. So you start walking down here, 15 seconds is uh, what I can do it in, mate. <laughs> I'll count that if you have to. That's fine. That's some short books. <laughs> Churned out. Churned them out. Churned out makes it just sound like there. <laughs> so the first book I wrote, Still Waiting for the Punchline, is about a classic writer. Oh yeah, I should probably say up until like, like now I've actually read books. <laughs> so... Still waiting for the punchline is basically me sat in COVID, still waiting for my life to finally like start, even though it has started but it hasn't through COVID. Um and it's sort of a hangout book. This is a book where you just hang out with characters. Um so I thought films get to be artistic. Why can't a book be artistic? <laughs> I can I do know the name of my own book. I just don't know like the correct like syllables of it. A cigarette on the lips seals words of trouble. And this is what I've put as the under thing. Describes itself as popcorn gloss written by Aaron Thompson, which is me. And we've got this little This is a book where it's like in different sizes. There's pictures. So I basically told the story there's like, I don't know if you can see, there's pictures and there's different font and different different characters. It's basically like a, a play. There we go. Got some big font there. So I basically tried to make an artsy book. So there is actually a story to this. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> I, I seriously can't. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there is there is a story to this. Don't know what it is, <laughs> but I think it's I think it's really cool. I look at a page. Let's see if I can work out. Yeah, I actually think this is about writing a book. You know. Yeah, it wasn't it like somebody sent an email back and forth from there. Yeah, the so basically, I was getting loads of emails about like my writing career to me, and a lot of the emails were like, "We can't do anything," and it was things like, basically, just fend for yourself. So I thought, okay, I will. So I created loads of characters in here what <laughs> just fend for themselves in the book. Exciting. The bartender's handbook. This is basically all my years of bartending and working service put into this fictional airport, even though I worked at the airport. It's exciting because I wrote this in four days. Like, I just went crazy. Like, I was not a happy guy. I wrote this, but um, 
it's the first fictional story I've ever wrote. Even though the other book's fictional, of course, but this is like the probably first fictional book. It's got some photos by Peter Allen and Claire in the back. Um, yeah, and it's told in four four perspectives. So, in 2021, uh, in 2020, it was just survival for me. I think I pulled survival off. So in 2021, I had a bit more freedom on what I was going to do with my career, and things were still opening back up. So. Myself, my girlfriend Sophia, my long-term collaborator Peter, decide to go on a road trip. I need you to look into camera now and say, I'm so very excited. So very excited. I wasn't, you need to say into camera, I'm so very excited. Well, I'm not very excited because I've just spilled water all over the sea. Without like a scrapbook where we shot a road trip, we went from Land's End to John O'Groats and we also stayed in Wales and when we got to each point so Land's End bottom of England Wales we just picked a random beach and then John O'Groats the top we were going to write on a piece of paper what we wanted to get rid of what baggage we were carrying and we put it under a rock and then we'd move on so this is also a feature length film and um, this year again just came out of many resources and uh, help from all over the place and we've got musicians working on it it basically became a scrapbook film we had 10 different cameras i think even more i think maybe like 14 cameras we had like cameras in like the glove box with some tape to the roof in the back we just had cameras everywhere and we just filmed it in loads of different styles we were taking pictures and the road trip starts in doncaster which is really important for me and peter not so much for sophia because she lives in london but it's really important that we were showing you can get out the area and you can go on adventures and you can see things um oh and the the film's called russian gold so i moved back to the area in in 2020 it's like Feb i moved back into the area like february 2021 people what have gone out and and done things uh, you know achieve things do need to come back and show a little support to people what are coming up so this is what i've tried to do i've i've come back and i've started a podcast in the new fringe building and um, we're actually also working on two other studios so we can expand it a bit more and make it a bit easier um, and the podcast doesn't actually focus center around art it just focuses about people in the area just trying to get them down to talk about their life just to try and open things up more i also shot a film called kaika in Doncaster Dome, which was one of the most incredible things I've ever done, because that Doncaster Dome is like my childhood, and every time I drive past it, it's just such a nostalgic feeling. It wasn't really a film, I, I wanted to create like a place where you could just imagine things, so it's like a soundscape on top of loads of visual shots of the dome, what is shot in a way, so it's almost like a post apocalyptic and um, futuristic, like dome, what's kept people in from like. An explosion, and there's different like voices, which inspired inspired a bit by Bioshock. If anybody's ever played that, where you pick up tapes and you listen to somebody's story, to get to listen to those people's stories. In the yeah, I don't I don't really call it a film. It's more just like an, an art piece, what people can experience and check out. So when you become a filmmaker or a writer or in my case both. You're going to get a lot of questions off people, like, how much does that pay? How do you do that? Why are you doing that? Um, so I think I think the skill set you get from that is enormous. I mean, I've travelled to some incredible places, and I don't think I could have done that necessarily if I wasn't a filmmaker, mainly because being a filmmaker has given me this, like, extra energy and extra interest in other people's lives, so I just want to travel constantly. Um and it's also the sort of searching for something. So it's given me all these opportunities to sort of live life the way I want it. And giving me skills like, you know, skills in management and, and dealing with people. So, so really, like, film is all encompassing, really. And it's not just uh, one job. 
it's many other jobs and there are many ways to survive while doing the job you can pick up freelance work as a writer you can pick up freelance work as a videographer i do loads of music videos you can you know there are things you can do to survive working at the indie level now i work at the indie level because i absolutely love independent films and quite truthfully it's the bracket i'm happy being in and you know i hope one day my films can get picked up and I can get an even bigger budget I can do something even more cool but quite honestly I'm generally just happy just working at the bracket I'm in and hopefully maybe another five years I'll be saying something different but as of now this is are you drawing a picture of me? Yes. <laughs> I, can, you know? I can see you looking at me and just like <laughs> <laughs> obviously with film there's so much cre creativity you can do I'll probably say to the younger generation, I had n never wanted to do any of this and had, had no idea. I'd say now it's time for you guys to focus on what you want to bring to the future. And I generally do think like the independent scenes are also going online. Sites like Mubai where you can stream independent films is not an advert for them. Mm -hmm. um, Other streaming services are available. Other streaming services are available, but Mubai is the best. <laughs> 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 please, please sponsor me move by um, but I'm, hopefully we can flash a clip in this part now but... oh, let's say that you know it's, it's also uh, uh, filmmaking is like the fun of just working with people and just just enjoying life like you can you can do something what you enjoy and I think it's or even if you study filming and you don't go into film or you go into some other visual form I, f I think our generation now has to start to find what we want what we think is acceptable in a workplace so going forward, my my future plans are to try and move everything online now, and um, just so I can have like a space to sell things and and move things around where it's all sort of there. I don't have to worry about trying to impress that person to get them to try and sell my film. Now I have to take a trip down to London to have a coffee to try. I can do it all online, so that's my next step. Um, as always. I'm going to be working on another project. I think horror has been long overdue for me. Like, I absolutely love horror. And a lot of people are saying with your style, and I think, I mean, I think the black and white's coming back. I just want to say that <laughs> I was using black and white before anybody else. <laughs> you didn't <laughs> but, it was cool. Yeah. yeah and I, I think the black and white's going to come back. And I've got this idea what's brewing in my head. Um, hopefully, everything I've done starts to move finally right. um but yeah uh, i'm continuing to write i've actually thought of new, another two books i'd like to write um it's just been a while since so it's been like i think it's almost been a year you know since i've written something apart from that odd little pages here and there yeah I, i've written i've written like our pages of stuff but when I, when I say write i mean like write a book it's been a while since i've really written something Really gone off on the old typewriter or the old keyboard. Really gonna push podcasting because I think podcasting is the greatest art form. There's just one last thing that we need to say. Yeah. Is that you wanted this uh, this recording to be twenty minutes long? How long is it? Like an hour. One hour and twenty minutes. Really? 